Hello. Fuck. Na bird pe chal raha hai. Okay, wait. Hello. Welcome to a brand new episode of Tinkers Podcast. Huh? Are you laughing? I would uh No. Hello. <laughs> What is this? Well, I had to start it differently because I say good afternoon, good evening, good afternoon, good evening. Let us see it differently. Anyways, uh, welcome to another podcast, guys. I am Keith, one of the doctors here in the UK Foundation Doctors, and we have a pediatrician assistant with us, Dr. Arun Nair. Hello. 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 What are we talking about today? We are talking about gestational diabetes mellitus. Whoa! Sounds very complicated. Uh, I'll just have a go with it because I'm not a pediatrician. I have a little, very little bit of knowledge, but I'll give it a go. So gestational means like gestation during pregnancy. And then diabetes, we all know diabetes. Mellitus, I actually don't know what that is, but gestational diabetes mellitus. There you go. Uh, and uh, you tend to, so, so people who have gestational diabetes may not have diabetes before, and it tends to not persist after. Although some people may do have Uh, risk, but it does not tend to persist. So there you go. And tell us the rest, doctor. What is what else? What should we know about gestational diabetes? <laughs> oh, thank you for the intro. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right. So as Dr. Keith very correctly said, gestational diabetes mellitus typically begins during the onset of pregnancy, and you typically screen for it between twenty four to twenty eight weeks of gestation. Yeah, when you do a glucose oral glucose tolerance test, an OGTT, and there are different cutoff values that are used to diagnose this. Now, interestingly, gestational diabetes can actually persist up to six weeks postpartum, which means after delivery. So that's oh, why yeah. women who have been diagnosed with gestational diabetes often have to undergo another oral glucose tolerance test after delivery as well to monitor and to screen for any existing. Uh, gestational diabetes, and there is an increased risk of conversion to type two diabetes. But what I want to bring the conversation back to is the effects of gestational diabetes on the little kiddos that are born into this world. Can I can I guess the first one? Yeah, go for it. Is this hypoglycemia? Very well said, but you know my follow up question. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> Why is there hypoglycemia? Um, uh, I think because you have a lot of um. Because your blood, because the mom's blood sugar levels are high during gestation, uh, the baby's pancreas tends to produce more insulin, or gets gets primed to producing more insulin just to combat that. And you know, it's just physiological homeostasis. So when they are born, or like right after they are born, the body's used to producing a lot of insulin. The pancreas is used to producing a lot of insulin, which which leads to uh, hyperglycemia. That's one. Secondly, uh, they usually get a lot of their uh, nutritional nutrition from their mom through the uh, placenta but as they are born it probably takes a little bit of time for them to establish feeds so given their intake is low and then the pancreas might be increasing uh, producing a lot of insulin that sounds like a reason like a reasonable reason for having hyperglycemia is what i understand okay wrong. so you're not entirely wrong so the whole mechanism being the fact that when when a mom who's pregnant ends up developing you know glucose intolerance or insulin resistance yeah. right so basically as the glucose levels go up the insulin levels go up everything that the mom has essentially can be trans- transferred to the baby it's called vertical transmission through the placenta but glucose can cross the placenta insulin the maternal insulin cannot cross the placenta because the maternal insulin is bigger than glucose So therefore, it cannot cross the placenta. So what happens is the glucose keeps passing. The like you said, the fetal pancreas starts producing more insulin to combat the glucose that's incoming. Now, when the baby is born, there is no and you essentially cut the cord. There is no more source of glucose, but the baby has high insulin. So what does the insulin do? It starts eating away at the remainder of glucose storage in the in the kiddo's body. So what happens is the fact that the sugar levels start going down, and they can end up getting hypoglycemia. So what happens typically in the, in the hospital that I work at when uh, when I don't know if you've noticed, I start calling kids kiddos. So bear with me on this. 
is just becomes a habit right now That's for okay. some reason. So, so when these when these kiddos present with hypoglycemia, symptoms can include things like jitteriness, lethargy, decreased activity, decreased inclination to feeding. They may have even fast breathing as well. These can be signs of hypoglycemia. And so when you do a, and typically glucose is measured through a heel stick. So as in you do, or a heel prick, where you don't actually take an, a venous sample initially, where you prick the heel. And when you take a blood sample from there, like just like how like adults use a finger prick test, right? Yeah. Once that's low, sometimes you can give an oral glucose gel. And then you can even feed the baby, then check it again an hour later and monitor. If it's persistently low, you'll send a serum sample. So what does that mean? That's essentially collecting an intravenous sample of blood to check for what is the real glucose. Because sometimes kiddos who have cold feet, because when they're born, their thermoregulation is still in process, right? So when you have cold feet, sometimes you won't get an accurate value of glucose. So you would take a serum level. If that's low as well, that's an indication that sometimes these kiddos need a little bit more help. So you would take them to the uh, NICU sometimes, the NICU, and you would start them on a particular type of fluid. What, what fluid do you think uh, we'd start them on? Uh, fluid with dextrose, 10%. Yes, exactly. Mame. So you start them on D10, like you said, D10 in water. And basically dextrose, 10% in water. You'd start them on these fluids and you'd know, obviously everything in pediatrics is weight-based. All right. So it depends. Is the kid feeding? You might put feeds plus 50 milligrams per kilo per day. If the kid's not feeding at all, you may put them NPO and put it up to 80 or 90 milligrams, milliliters or milligrams per kilo per day. All right. So there's different variations of how you can target hypoglycemia. But interestingly, what other effects does gestational diabetes mellitus have on a growing fetus? What is it? Macrosomia. Macrosomia. So what is macrosomia? Just macro is... Big somia's body, so big body. A big body. So typically you describe them as being above the tenth uh, above the 90th, 90th percent. 90th percent. 90th percentile uh, of their growth chart for their appropriate gestational age. So they can be macrosomic. And these macrosomic babies sometimes can cause problems during delivery. Mm -hmm. So especially because of their size, you can have something called cephalopelvic disproportion where basically the baby's too big to go through the pelvic outlet and the inlet. And sometimes, A, either the, there can be failure to progress in labor, their baby can get stuck. So these are things to consider or plan ahead for, and maybe even consider, should we do a cesarean section or should we try a normal uh, spontaneous vaginal delivery? So these are things to consider during labor. And even with gestational diabetes infants, you can have birth trauma sometimes. So sometimes you'd need to use things like a vacuum or forceps as well. Very famously, everyone knows Sylvester Stallone, who played Rocky. So Sylvester Stallone was actually delivered using forceps. I don't know. Which is, yeah, so which is why when, when he says, yo, Adrian, he has a kind of like a natural sort of uh, uh, droop on one side of his face. It's mm -hmm. because of the of a life lifelong side effect of using forceps during delivery sometimes. So techniques have varied in terms of, you know, how to sort of increase the size of the pelvic outlet through different maneuvers, such as applying suprapubic pressure or the galliat or the, uh, uh, there was a particular maneuver, I'm blanking on my ob now, but there are many different maneuvers. The McRoberts maneuver is something that you can use, you know, and there's a couple of other stuff. Uh, I mean, what ob do are amazing. My, my 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 obi has been blank for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not lighting up anytime soon. Anyways, that's really good. Can I uh, take you back to one point? So we talked yeah. about. So let's talk about blood sugars. So what what are the ranges there that they consider low or what's normal? Mm. So typically, we'd want to keep the blood sugars above forty five. Initially, what's forty five? Forty five is the four point five. Oh. 45 milligrams per deciliter. So that would be 4.5 millimoles? Roughly divide by 11. Okay. Yeah. More or less. And, okay. and as, as kids grow older, you want to keep it above 60. 
So after a couple of days, you want to keep start increasing the, the cutoff range. So if, if a kid's able to maintain glucose levels above 60 milligrams per deciliter, so that would roughly be about 5.5. Uh, millimoles per liter. Sorry, uh, so that I don't say something stupid. One second. Uh, okay. So for us here, if it's less than two point, actually, essentially, if it's less than three, is when we would be worried yeah. about. So uh, forty-five. It's forty-five. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Two point five. Yeah. yeah, you're right. There you go. Uh, so 5. so around two point five, correct. So less than two point yeah. five, we would be a thing. And then, yeah. like you said, as you grow older, then the range changes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And sometimes, very importantly, hypoglycemia can be a sign of neonatal sepsis as well. Oh yes, yes, yes. Sometimes when uh, you do have hypoglycemia and you don't have, let's say, gestational diabetes, and you're mm -hmm. trying to figure out why the baby has hyperglycemia. Uh, that could be neonatal, like queer neonatal sepsis, and you try to preemptively, some, sometimes, depending upon the situation, and other kind of uh, parameters, southern one antibiotics, yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, um, another, another sort of um, manifestation of gestational diabetes I wanted to talk about was an increased risk of uh, congenital defects, mm -hmm. or congenital malformations. So there have been various, many, many different congenital diseases associated with the presence of gestational diabetes mellitus. So anything from, you know, sometimes even cleft lips, cleft palates, things like, you know, any sort of like, you know, uh, limb abnormalities, renal abnormalities, cardiac, congenital cardiac disease. These have all been linked back to gestational diabetes, especially the, the cases where there have been lack of control. And speaking of control, there are three levels or three tiers to control. The first stage being through diet. The second stage being through oral medications, such as metformin, which is the first line. And lastly, being through insulin. And there have been many cases where even insulin cannot control their blood, blood glucose. So sometimes patients go on both metformin and insulin. But again, you'd have to look out for things like hypoglycemia in an adult as well. right? So these are very, very important things to remember. Last but not least, what's the most common cardiac manifestation? In, uh, in people with gestational diabetes or in general? In, in, a, in a kiddo with gestational diabetes mouth, who is born to a mom with gestational diabetes mouth. Is it tough? No. To told your fellow, no. VSD? PDE? No. It's actually hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Oh, I don't know that. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing uh, that I learned as well because I was wondering I was like I, w I always thought it was like a genetic defect, you know, mm. like it's like a like an inherited sort of thing, but funnily enough, or not funnily enough, but like interestingly enough, the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that results from gestational diabetes actually is transient. It goes back down. Mm. That's pretty interesting, huh? How long does it take? That's a good question. Now, that is something that I'd have to look up in terms of how long it takes to go back down, but it's definitely, it should be within the first year, two years. Okay. It should go back down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That, you didn't see that. Nobody saw that. Uh, I fiddled the ring too much. Anyways, what, were, what else would I want to ask? Yeah, how do you correct that? So here what we do is, so... The care in the UK, or uh, maybe similar in other places as well, we are most of protocol driven. Everybody, even the consultant, everybody does the same thing. Everybody does the same thing. So the intern does the same thing. The SSU does the same thing. Rich does the same thing. Consult does the same thing. Unless and until it's a situation which the protocol does not cover is when the consultant intervenes and maybe asks other consultants even. Yeah. But, uh, we So when we when so the first line of thing here is, what we say, glucobus or glucogel. So it's essentially like... An oral glucose gel. Yeah, oral glucose gel. Is it the same thing there or...? Yeah. Okay. We and... give it twice. That's the limit. Yeah, you give it twice. Yeah. Oh, it's similar here. Give it yeah. twice and then you consider uh, IV dextrose, as you yeah. said. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But after confirming the glucose levels with a serum glucose level. Yeah, I, I haven't dwelt into it because the thing is we have uh, like we have shifts that are varied. So we have pediatric shifts and then we have uh, what we call skibu, 
uh, special KBB universities. Right. Uh, my kind of exposure is sort of medium. Mm. I'm more so like pediatric. Yeah. Uh, cool. That's really good. Uh, I think we learned. We all learned a bit here because you know it's it's more so. It is very interesting, but it's not my pr- preliminary interest. So I tend not to spend <laughs> more time outside of what I actually learn in hospital to read about these things. Mm. But uh, that's a very good session. Thank you. Dr. Runayer, and uh, if you guys have any questions again, just to let us know. We're best to ask. You can ask me, but we're best to ask Dr. Run. Uh, and uh, that's all. Uh, I think. Yeah. And anyone looking to become a pediatrician? Yeah. Join yeah. the club. That's all I'm saying. Let yeah. me know. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 give my call when my topic comes. I'm, <laughs> not, gonna plug, I'm not gonna plug in it here. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. I'm going to ask her.